Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Wendy Litsky, um, filling in for Dave Barrett, uh, who is away. Um, so welcome to the April 8th uh, work session meeting of the um, Great Valley School District. Um, we'll dive right in. I know there's a national championship game tonight, but it's not until nine, and we don't have any fighting Philadelphia interest in it. I rep the Big East because of Villanova, so I'm rooting for UConn, but you guys can root for whoever you want. Um, all right, I think first up are the comments from the student reps. So if you guys want to come up, and that would be great. Hi, you guys. Tell us what's going on at the high school. So first, Great Valley hosted a prom dress closet where students could browse a wide selection of prom attire and take home free formal wear. Other than dresses, there were also shoes, jewelry, and other accessories available for free. And additionally, students were able to get free raffle tickets to win prizes such as tux rentals, makeup, and haircuts. Next, we wanted to talk a little bit about the Desmond Student Achievers Banquet, um, which is a collaboration between the Desmond Hotel in Malvern and the students who are interested in business and taking business electives at Great Valley. And it's, it's, it's essentially um, a way to honor students from each grade that have been selected by faculty members for excellence in a specific subject or overall academic excellence. Um, but essentially this event is entirely student planned, organized and staffed, and it'll take place on April 21st at the Desmond Hotel. And finally, we would just like to talk about our spring musical, which is Mean Girls. It'll open this Thursday and it'll close on Saturday night. And the cast and crew have worked really hard on the show. So if, please come to see the show if you have the time to. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. So Dr. Gafredo, we have the social studies curriculum here just for review. Um, FYI, correct? And then also the monthly enrollment report. Correct. I don't know if there's any questions. I know Dr. O'Toole's here. Uh, we also had our instructional subcommittee meeting right before this. If there's any questions, please let us know. All right, great. Um, policies for second reading and adoption policy committee. The policies there are uh, written there. We've discussed them um, over the past few meetings. Um, so nothing new, no changes. And our next meeting is April 30th. Great, any questions? All right. Over to Dan for the um, superintendent's report. Thank you very much. I do have a presentation. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Litsky. A um, couple of updates from both our prior meeting and also our larger finance committee meeting, which was held on Tuesday, April 2nd. Uh, going back to our last board meeting, I know there were uh, some questions about a middle school situation involving social media, namely TikTok. Um, since that time, I, I know there's been a lot of concern both expressed from the board and from our staff. I had the opportunity to en engage the teachers for the better part of an hour and a half. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for our staff, but I can certainly say the incident and some of the posts from students has had a profound and negative effect on our hardworking teachers. Um, we'll continue to monitor and, and support. I think it's also shined a light on some efforts that we need to embrace as a, as a school district around digital citizenship and um, support. Uh, to that, I know Dr. Souders recently, our middle school principal, had Josh Gibbon in from the Attorney General's office, their outreach department on a topic, uh, thank you very much, um, regarding social media and the impact. The title of the program was Sticks and Stones, Staying Smart and Safe Online. It was very well received and I know the presentations went across the grades. So we are, I want to affirm the board because I know this issue is very concerning to you as well, uh, that we are looking for other opportunities to engage both what we do with outside presenters, but it doesn't stop there. It's what do we do 
naturally and on a regular basis and on an organic basis as a district to um, reestablish the culture that I think we, we want to see with our students. So um, I did want to provide some, some context there to can this I, latest situation. Can I just add to that? Because Dr. Souders is having that same body in tomorrow night at the middle school to do a parent's presentation, which I think is super helpful for all of the middle school parents and beyond to get a handle on social media too. So I think that's a great part of that outreach. I just want to add, I, I, I know we all think um, what happened is, is absolutely despicable and must not happen again. Um, and I'm glad we're doing all of this now and you say we're doing some more organic things, but I want to make sure that we continue into the future. This is this year, maybe next year's quiet, but I want to make sure there's nothing the year after that, right? So how do we, we always keep this in the forefront so that we're preventing proactively um, and, you know, we don't know what we don't know. There's new media coming out all the time. I just want to make sure we stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly assure you that we will. Um, so I, again, appreciate the, the support for our staff on behalf of the board, and um, I'll continue to keep you apprised should anything change further. Also, as a follow-up, uh, is our since our last board meeting is on redistricting, and the team has been doing a lot of work around uh, our planning and our support for transition for students, for close to about 180 students who will attend a new Great Valley Elementary School next year. Um, here's just a few key items that we're working on. To give you some detail, I want to assure you that our principals, counselors, and other key members are working on a variety of activities for our families. Uh, one of them includes postcards, and I can display two slides here. Here's Dr. Hoffritz with a warm welcome to Katie Markley. Uh, these postcards would go out shortly, and they have a QR code. There will be a QR code where uh, students can scan it and get a welcome message from both the principal and the mascot. And so not to be outdone, Mr. Paquel has his welcome card that will be going out to the new stu students at Charlestown. There you see the QR code, and here you get a sense of what it looks like in Spanish as well. So uh, a lot of work going into the, the effort. So these cards will go out shortly. The week of April 22nd, we will communicate directly with any impacted family so that they know the precise and exact timeline of transition activities. When will the open houses be? When will we have other opportunities? Um, students will be bused. Uh, we recognize not every family is going to have the means to get children there for some of the open houses on weekends. So we are working on establishing some dates in May where we'll actually bus students over. Uh, they'll have time on the playgrounds, uh, they'll meet their peers, they'll meet some teachers, they'll even get t-shirts welcoming them to their new school. Um, so again, I, I really thank the team. I know Ms. Blake has worked directly with our principals and the counselors and, and so on. So I do want to assure the board at this time, we are finalizing dates, but there will be multiple open house opportunities for par parents to come in spring, summer, and into August um, to explore their new, their new homes. Um, also, I know Mr. Brickell has established a liaison within Malvern Court who has been very helpful. We have several key individuals speak at board meetings, and we've done some outreach there, and they are now partnering and working with us. More work with the PTOs will continue next month, so the principals do have plans to work with PTOs and expand that partnership to make the transition as, as seamless as possible. Lastly, uh, just to give you detail, we will be communicating directly with families who receive specialized services. And by that, I'm talking about students who have an IEP, a 504, a GIEP, ESL. And so we are working on the best way to communicate that directly, whether that's going to be here from a central point at district office or whether we let the buildings do that. So we're working on that. But in those, those months ahead, we'll make sure that that is a prime consideration and that families are contacted directly so that they know, and I will say this to be abundantly clear, there will be no interruption of service. Every service that's offered in their current school will be continued and extended in their new school. So um, more to come as the plans get finalized and dates get on the books, but I at least wanted to give you a sense of where we are at this juncture. Yeah, I just, I think, I, I love the plans, I love the postcard. Um, I just, as we continue to invite families and students into the new schools, I just want to make sure that other students are there. I want to, you know, make sure that we're creating as many opportunities as possible for students to recognize other students from other activities or from, you know, the neighborhood next door. Um, I know Dr. Hoffritz did some things over the summer where he had the student council come in and be the representative for new students. But 
just make sure that other students are involved in this. So we really are, we're making parents feel welcome, but we wanna make sure students have a familiar face on the first day. Agreed, and that's why I thought the idea of actually taking children during the, the month of May and sending them over to meet classmates, and uh, I know they're even working on, as, as certain neighborhoods go, can we make sure there's at least one peer or neighborhood friend in a class, a familiar face? So the principals are doing all of that accounting as they start to schedule and make their final preparation. Um, so those were some updates just regarding some prior meetings. Um, the new information that I'd like to share, and I know Ms. Dinsmore is going to assist me with this presentation, we are in the midst of budget season. And so with that, there's always discussion around staffing considerations for the upcoming school year. Um, I don't need to tell you that we continue to grow uh, substantially each and every year. Every year for the last four to five years, I've asked the board for staff in a variety of areas to meet changing demographics, uh, areas of support, and en enhanced program. And so uh, this budget season will be no different. Um, three positions that we, Ms. Dinsmore and I, would like to address with you. One is uh, what I see as a need for a student services, and I'll call it special education supervisor or administrator to help. And we have some just fundamental data regarding special education that I think um, will we'll provide the supporting evidence for a position such as this. Also, I want to expand on our latest finance meeting where there were concerns about our increase in special education teachers per the opening of the 5 6 M. I know Mr. Barrett isn't here, but he was one voice in particular uh, that really wanted to make sure why do we need to add several new special education positions when by and large we're just taking the same population and dispersing it across seven schools. Ms. Dinsmore and I will address that. And then the nursing support. We had talked about this in our finance meeting, so I did want to come back. Next Monday, we will continue discussion on more programmatic systems of support. I know there have been discussions in prior board meetings about interventionists and supports at our high school and what those look like. And so Dr. Beck, I believe Ms. Dinsmore will be back for that one along with Dr. Wexler. will give a high level view of systems of support, K to 12, and what some of the staffing positions look like. And I know there was even a request for us to frame and outline all of the current ESSER funded positions and their role, and we'll be prepared to provide that to the board as well on the 15th. Uh, but for this evening, I'd like to just, uh, for the purposes of my presentation, hone in on these three uh, specific positions. So uh, what you see right now working left to right are special education numbers here in the district. Uh, they serve as percentages of our overall population. If you look at the second line from the bottom, that is the overall number of special students identified in special education. So 2018, we had 737 students, and then you work through. Um, this current year, we're at 859. So in that five-year stretch, six-year stretch, uh, we increased well over 120 students. And for next year, we expect we anticipate 889 students identified for special education in the district. And you can see some of the comps to the state and where we are uh, breaking it out by disability. So special education is an area of growth within the district. Um, I do like to view it somewhat as a point of pride that I think parents know they get good service, uh, particularly when it comes to autistic support and programming. Uh, but also with many of the other conditions that you see on here. Um, and so in a way, I do know that people shop around when they pick a school district, and Great Valley, when it comes to special education, tends to rise to the top. So um, with that, we, we will have some, some areas of, of need, which we'll talk about here this evening. Here's a breakdown of our numbers just looking by school, and you can see where we are currently. And then next year's numbers, which do reflect any sort of redistricting pop, redistricted populations. Um, of the 179 students who were redistricted, it really is a very small percentage of them who are identified as special education. I believe it was less than 20, if I'm correct. Am I right on that? Yeah, it's about 20. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you think that's not really going to skew the numbers. One little identifier that I want to show here as you look at the schools, that early intervention number, the second line, uh, I have commented repeatedly now that early intervention numbers coming out of the IU and here in Chester County 
are double what they were historically. And I think this is a trend that we're going to see, partly why the intermediate unit is even building facilities out in our part of the county to help meet this rising need. It's going to affect our intermediate unit, and it's also going to affect school districts. Can you explain exactly what that line means, early intervention, because the other lines are named for our schools? Correct. It's brief before they get to school? It, it is. And Ms. Dinsmore, do you want to explain? I think you'll sure. do a, a more particular Thank you. way. Sure. So our early intervention program, these are students who would be integrated into our kindergarten programs throughout the four elementary. So in that line from this current school year, it says not applicable. The reason being is that those numbers are accounted for in the kindergarten numbers of the elementary school. So you could see a difference um, in higher numbers for this year as opposed to next year in some of the buildings. The early intervention students receive evaluations and then offers of a school age IEP. So at present, we have about eight families who've registered, been evaluated and gone through that process. So that process is also indicative of what program the students will be served in. So although we have paperwork coming from the intermediate unit, we don't fully predetermine where everyone will be served. So that 75, you will then see dispersed into the four elementary schools. Which is critical because we will come back to that. When you look at the 23, 24 numbers, there's no intervention because those students are already here. They're attending our schools. They're accounted for. For next year, you may see a dozen go to one school, a dozen go to another. So it is a little bit of a deceiving picture. You could look at that and say, wow, Charlestown, pretty much flat. No, those early intervention students are still not dispersed into those elementary numbers. So you will see the elementary enrollment numbers go up because the 75 are pulled out as they register and come online and we determine their attendance boundary, then you will see those numbers go up. So uh, that's really critical and I think we're gonna revisit this in a few slides uh, as we as we continue. So it took me a while, but you're saying that be based on whatever is assessed with, for their needs, they will be sent to different schools where those needs can be met and that's why they're not assigned. I, it took me a while. That's okay. I, I'm just repeating it because that's correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is a trend that we expect to see in the near future uh, as the numbers continue to really be on the rise, not only in Great Valley, but across all of Chester County. All right. Any other questions so that you understand what you're looking at? I think that's really important as we move forward. Okay, all right. So in the area when it comes to supervision, obviously if you have more students, you get more teachers, uh, particularly with autistic support. We have added autistic support programs every year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say for four to five years, it continues to grow. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. We need a lot of supervision. There's a lot of staff. And so as our numbers continue to grow, I think you saw the 2018 number, we were in the low 700s. We're now pushing 900 when it comes to our special ed enrollment um, in just seven or eight years later. Um, so with that, we've uh, increased some of our special ed, but we also need some more oversight administratively. Here's our current structure. I'll give you a moment just to take that in. We have three special education supervisors, two who serve the elementary and one who serves the high school and middle school. And that's a big task. We also have a teacher on assignment that is one of a member of our collective bargaining unit who works here, still a teacher, but also works in a supportive role, but is not considered an administrator, but it is an extra set of hands um, to kind of support the, the work. So you can look at the responsibility, even one supervisor covering two elementary schools, um, you can see the breakdown. Uh, we feel particularly with our specialized programming, we need to lay more eyes on those specialized programs and divert more time there and also bring some relief to one person covering the entire high school and middle school with the support of a teacher on assignment is a real heavy lift. Even the elementary, uh, as students are first being identified, there's a lot going on in those early years that requires a lot of engagement and a lot of work. So our proposal is to bring on a fourth supervisor. You can see how the roles um, will disperse and maybe I'll give you a minute to just process that and Ms. Dinsmore and I can take questions. Can you just speak to how the teacher on assignment category works with those those two supervisors? Sure. So at present, just for historical or current context, that super, that teacher on assignment is used to support our students who are full time at Technical College High School. 
So that is a caseload that that person supports. There are also other students who are placed outside of the district. So we, tip, we are typically using our teacher on assignment to help with those. They are also individuals who are involved with attending meetings at both the middle school and high school currently. So in this particular model of still serving those two roles, there will be at least some continuity with some of the out of district support because they're used to working with that individual. How do the ratios that are that we have today and the ratios that are proposed um, compare to whatever best practices as far as ratios for that? So it depends upon the needs of the students that the district is serving. So currently we have learning support programs which serve a myriad of students with different varying disabilities. We also have specialized programs like our emotional support program, autistic support, multiple disability support. So depending upon the complexity of the students that they're serving, it requires more oversight. So if there are more complexities to the disability, there are more goals, there's usually more therapists who are involved with those individuals. And as a result, it's a little bit more time consuming. So although the caseload that's proposed is a little bit lower for the individual who's serving, the students with complex needs, the time intensity of serving those particular cases is a little bit more than it might be with some other cases. Not always true, but in some cases. And the supervisor is always part of the IEP discussions too. So they're, when you see the numbers, like they're in at least that many meetings so, every year. So that's a great question. So our administrators, our building administrators, our assistant principals, and at times our principals will join IEP meetings. If there is a need for the expertise of a special education trained individual they're joining, for the most part, our special education supervisors are participating in many of the meetings that are happening because in our particular district also, there's a, a quality expectation. And so we're putting individuals with the best knowledge in those meetings if we can. And just to tie in some data from the previous slide, out of district, we have shown 74 IEPs that are out of district that then get dispersed um, that are that are included in the draft. So uh, there's a substantial number of out of district IEPs that we also need to manage. That's true. And some of those students within that 74, they're not all students who are necessarily served in programs for kids with more extreme types of disability. They are also students who might attend TCHS full time and receive IEP services. So the overall trend with our growth pattern of where we're going, the increase of more complex needs and programming, I would say one autistic support program is since more has approximately how many adults within it? In Adult terms of staff members. So there, there, you could have students who each have a one-to-one -one, depending upon the complexity, which typically happens in the multi-disability support. In our autistic support programs, we do try to reduce that and also um, change staff, but the teachers are responsible for oversight of those individuals also. But we have registered behavior technicians, we have personal care assistants, um, so there are varying levels of training of the individuals who are in those programs. Is it safe to say it could be anywhere five to ten adults serving one, one established program? Um, you, I mean, our ratios currently are about one to eight in terms of teacher to student, so it's usually a little bit lower okay. than that, but at most you could have each student having a one-to-one. -one. And that's why I'm looking at total number of adults supporting the, ch the child enrolled. Um, but the reason I pose that question is there is a lot of coordination of adults, multiple services that needs to be orchestrated, and as we continue to add programs each and every year, uh, this is something that we've identified as significant. And I would say to your point, Dr. Grifredo, it's the therapists that are involved as well, just outside of our personal care assistants and registered behavior technicians. A student may have an occupational therapist. They may be seeing a mental health counselor or consultant. There might be a physical therapist who's involved. We do orientation and mobility, which is some um, vision training. There's vocational training. So it's coordination of all of those individuals that serve that comprehensive program. Other questions, point of clarification, anything additional for you to give this future consideration? Okay, all right. Well, thank you. So position one of three. Next is looking at our K-8 to special education staffing. 
This really is directly born from our last finance meeting on April 2nd, uh, as we framed some of the, the positions. Um, I am gonna hand it over to Ms. Dinsmore in just a second, but I do want the board members to know that since our finance meeting, we have reduced our lear learning support staffing needs uh, by one position for the five, six center. So as we've done that deeper dive, looking at things, um, it's very likely that as we look at this trend that that position may need to come back next year. But for now, Andrea and I feel pretty solid that we could make one reduction of those new learning support positions. So um, that would thus move that number from about five to four. In addition, however, even though we're, we're making some limitations uh, to our staffing and um, we know that we can do with a little less there, um, we are gonna be adding an autistic support program at General Wayne. So you take one away, one, one gets added. Um, in addition, I do know we have some contracted services at the IU and as we started to look at the expense of those services, we think we could redirect those funds more internally towards a Great Valley staff person, let it almost be cost neutral, and that would be a position as well where we could rein in some of those external costs, get our own person who we can train, develop, and, and serve for very much about the same expense for what we're paying to contract these services to the IU. So again, there, there's, it is a complex um, formula as we look at all the staffing, but I know Ms. Dinsmore and I are, are gonna kind of work to make sure you understand why we need some additional teachers moving forward. So um, unless there's any questions, I'll hand it over to Andrea and we'll just talk about this K-8 special education staffing scenario. Andrea? Okay, so we're revisiting the slide that we had looked at previously when we were discussing the supervisor. So in this particular slide, you can see the changes between what is occurring in buildings now in terms of numbers and then what we're looking at after redistricting. So just as a review again, highlighting that that early intervention is not its own building. So while it's listed as 75, again, those students will be kindergartners for next year and will be dispersed across four buildings. So as you're looking at numbers, like Sugartown being at 34, based on our preliminary review and meetings with families, we are going to be serving students at a little bit of a higher number at Sugartown. So you'll, you'll see that come through. It's really important. I know there's this idea that, well, fifth grade is coming out, you're gonna be serving less students, but you can see with higher early intervention numbers, uh, a fair number are gonna go back into these schools. And those numbers are reflective of serving um, early intervention being aside, but it's current kindergarten who would be first grade next year through third grade. So the numbers for fourth and fifth grade are pulled out and then they're addressed in the five, six center. On this particular slide, this gives just a basic overview. I say basic, but there's a lot on this particular slide, just at the amount of staff that we have currently. So just to give you some explanation as to what's listed as special education, because certainly every position that's listed here is one of a special educator. Special education is more inclusive of learning support. We are cautious with coining the term learning support because we have students with varying needs who are served by our teachers. And so it's not always just students with learning disabilities who are on those caseloads. So we've listed out as special education teacher, you will see for buildings where autistic support is present that that is listed and also emotional support as a program and multiple disability support. At times we will combine the positions when we discuss them and say autistic support and multiple disability support. At the elementary level, it is a separate program. As we try to look at efficiency throughout our programs at secondary, if we have one student or two students that would be a lower caseload, we do integrate them with other students um, in combined caseloads. And we address that in our special education plan, which we'll talk about a little bit next week as well. So I'll just give you a little bit of time to, to review the numbers that are there. You can see that due to some of the shifts in enrollment at General Wayne in particular, we are transferring one of the positions that's titled as that special education. So a learning support position, which will transfer to the five, six. You can see the asterisk for next year next to autistic support because while we currently have two autistic support programs at General Wayne, due to our early intervention numbers, we are anticipating the addition of a third classroom in that particular program. And just to provide some additional context, if you look at Charlestown, 
two teachers. Next year, it remains two teachers, even if we add some early intervention numbers. Uh, Sugartown, um, which, as I've learned more as we broke it down, has more of a um, uh, intense reading support need. So we may need an additional learning support teacher at Sugartown, even though they may have comparable numbers to Charlestown. As Andrea said, the need is different. And so therefore we need um, an additional person at Sugartown. You can look on the surface and say, wow, they have approximately the same number of special ed children. However, it's based on the needs and the complexity of those needs. And that's um, how our staffing is, is determined. I'm not following because you just said Sugartown needs an additional, but it goes down. It does, but it's still one more than Charlestown. Oh. Charlestown's at two and Sugartown is okay. at three. But, but it's if one you... less than it has this year. Correct. However, if you looked at just the raw numbers of special ed students at Charlestown and Sugartown, they are comparable on that previous slide. That's all. So I, again, I should have been more, I'm synthesizing those two slides um, to really frame that. Um, additionally, uh, to break this down to fund, or not fund, but to support the 5-6 center, we're looking at transferring one teacher from Sugartown, I believe one from General Wayne, and two from Great Valley Middle School. So that's four teachers who will be reassigned to the 5-6 center. But as we work through the presentation, there still is gonna be some additional need uh, based on the reasons that I think Andrea is just starting to, to shed light on. I may have missed it when you were explaining the, the roles of these different um, mm -hmm. teachers, but emotional support is only listed at middle school. Is it because it's combined in the other roles? At the yes, ranges? that's okay. a great question. So at our elementary level, it is integrated. So we have, again, a teacher who's special education who might be easier to understand learning support. And that teacher is responsible for a more integrated approach because we are still looking to provide itinerant level of support and emotional support and not provide a separate and different program. And the half person yes. um, in at the middle school, is that anticipated to be shared with another building yes. or how? Yes, thank you very much. So at the middle school, what's not listed within this set of buildings is our five, six center. So one of the, um, the funds that we're looking to redirect from the IU currently is we're paying for a related service of social skills currently for the middle school. So we are looking to redirect the funds that we would have otherwise spent on social skills to bring an itinerant autistic support teacher on board who would serve both our 5-6 program and Great Valley Middle School, which would then be a 7-8 program. And that is a model that is um, the same as what we offer at elementary. We have an itinerant autistic support teacher who serves students in different buildings in that level and then also at our high school. So the middle school was really that only position that was left um, that we were still using IU support. And part of that rationale is because Dr. Wexler, who's sitting with us also, helped to, to make those changes in the past. So we're looking to continue that work. I have a two, oh, go ahead. Um, no, I just, I, the, there's no five, six center captured here, which like I understand why, but you're looking at the changes across years. Um, but it would be helpful maybe to just visualize the whole kind of gestalt of the staffing for next year, if you could add a column or maybe it's the next slide with the needs for the five, six centers, centers just so we can get the whole picture. So I do have that available. So if if that's helpful, I can make sure that Dr. Gofredo shares that with you. Yeah, I mean, I was actually just, we were on the same wavelength. I was gonna say the same exact thing. And then the first part of that question was, I think seeing it holistically, second part of my question, First part of the question is if you, and again, I don't want to gloss over details, but just give us the top line on the totals from 12 in 23, 24 to 10.5 in 24, just so I'm understanding it correctly. Okay. So each building has its own staffing total in that particular sheet. So um, it's rather complex, but there is sort of a district vision. I know the audience can't really see that, but. Um, essentially where you can track what the buildings currently have and where they would go within that five, six center. Um, so currently we are asking for, if you can remember back to the chart when we were in finance, it was originally nine positions as Dr. Gofredo had shared. So we've reduced to eight positions at this point, four being transfers. And so we're requesting four for learning support then we are asking for an autistic support position. So in total, we'd be looking to hire five positions for the five, six center. 
and then we have a growth position at General Wayne, which was previously allocated when we were budgeting for the 5-6, but we were able to look at it again and feel that we can support General Wayne and look at numbers next year to see if we could make any internal transfers. So the overall ask for the 5-6 center is hiring of five. I'm sorry if I'm missing something. So is it hiring five, including the one and a half that you're gaining from this year to next year? Like, so, so going from 12 to 10.5 or 10, 10 and a half. So in this chart, there are different totals. So what you're seeing is not the number of positions in totality at the bottom. It's just specifically for Great Valley Middle School. So the numbers at the middle school were 12. I know, but it's, it's yes, I feel like that's that's the light bulb. That's the. <laughs> that that was yeah. very confusing because I'm sitting here looking at that going, wait. Feeling like it's the full total. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So legit. Yes. I was just kidding. It looks like it's 2.5 added for all these, right? Am I looking at that math right? So internally, he's skipping through something. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the way I'm looking at it. So again, not reflective of 5 6, but yes. So there is a growth position at General Wayne. So overall, most of what you're seeing are reductions. So there is a transfer of a position at General Wayne. There's a transfer of a position from Sugartown, both going to the 5-6, and a transfer of two positions coming from the middle school. So what you're seeing in 23-24 versus 24-25 is the reduction of those positions in each total. What you're not seeing is the 5-6 center, which includes those four transfers, four requests for learning support, and one request for autistic support. We are redirecting funds that we would have otherwise spent at the IU to, uh, to make um, some adjustments that are cost neutral. And then there's the growth position at General Wayne. I know these charts are like the bane of your existence and we always have trouble interpreting them, but I think if we can get a more holistic view of this, that's what I'm struggling with. So the, the only thing missing though is the five, six, and, and you so, can't compare totals from one year to the next without that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you say compare totals, because the five six center, we don't have a five six center this year, so it would just be for. I want to make sure I understand the. But the total in the district, like if we are, if we're adding this up mentally, we're missing a chunk. If, you know. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean. We are the five yeah. six center. Correct. So then we can't really see the growth. In the yeah, district. I, I think the Join point is we're serving the same number of students. It's so overall, I want to see how many teachers we need to serve the same number of students. However you want to break it down by school is fine, but we, we're we still serving, going to serve the same number of students. So it's okay if the 23-24 columns NA for 5-6, I want to see it in 24-25, and then I want to see that total, total, total in the bottom right. Okay. All right. I understand now. Yeah. And we can just come back and we'll do that on Monday. Mm -hmm. Yep. All, right. All right. With that, I mean, one of the factors as we bring that back to you is um, understanding. I know we, we didn't, we wanted to be kind of simplistic with our slides, is understanding when those services are provided. And so we've talked about the use of a core extension model. And so a lot of our specialized services occur during core extension. And so maybe I think we'll frame that conversation when we come back on Monday too because it does add to the need. Um, years ago, the district made the commitment that we're not gonna pull children out of math, and we're not gonna pull them out of reading, um, that we're gonna use that core extension. So as you get more children in special education, you often need more teachers because they're all pulling from the same area. And so I think let's make sure that we take some time to go over the core extension model too, uh, I think when we come back. Sure, all right. for the programmatic presentation. Please, yeah, okay. sure. yep, yep. Um, the third piece to this was with nursing considerations moving forward. Um, we do meet the requirement for certified school nurses for the district. Uh, we know it's a ratio of 150 students for every certified school nurse. Uh, 1,500, I'm sorry, what did I say? Oh, big difference. Yeah, I like big that difference. one. I like that one. Yeah, so yeah, we won't, we won't go that low. Um, 
So obviously, much like with special education, we're seeing a, a big shift in the complexity of student medical needs. And so, Andrea, do you want to um, discuss a little bit? I know you work directly with the nurses here. Sure, sure. So just to give, again, a bit of context, because we have medical professionals of different entry points that can serve students throughout school. So specifically the certified school nurse um, in terms of the paperwork side of things is required to track immunizations, send out regular letters to the community to ensure that there are either immunization exemptions that have occurred or that the immunizations themselves have occurred. Um, just caring for students with complex needs medically and uh, disability related. So as we increase the amount of students that we serve in our schools, which again is a, is a point of pride, rather than providing options outside of the district, we are welcoming students who may need a feeding tube in addition to accessing academics, breathing treatments, blood glucose monitoring, insulin injection, seizure management, things that might require emergency rescue meds. Our school nurses are also providing first aid and responding to emergencies. They are the medical professionals that are typically advising um, for 911 emergency calls in collaboration with building administration. One important point is that they are connecting with families to school-based resources. So as our community becomes more and more diverse, at times a nurse may be the only medical provider that a student has access to for whatever reason. So they are coordinating care and providing community resources and trying to track that and um, connect using some other funding sources so that we can get students where they need to be to be receiving treatment. They're also identifying and treating psychosomatic symptoms of mental health. So a student might come to the nurse's office feeling like they have a stomach ache and really it might be an experience of anxiety or stress. And so at times our nurses are the first to receive the student, ask questions, try to determine if there is a medical impact by coordinating with the family and then connecting with school counselors and bringing uh, mental health support to students when needed. They're also contributing to our 504 accommodation plans, which is one of the legal mandates in addition to PA code that um, is informing their practice. They contribute to our special education IEP documents and there are also um, individualized healthcare plans that they are maintaining. They are the individuals who receive physical education exemption or restriction notices when someone might have a surgery or have an injury and maintaining our concussion protocols. In addition to our in-district schools, they have oversight of immunization and screening for Villa Maria Lower School, Villa Maria High School, St. Patrick's School, and recently our Great Valley Home Education Program, which was typically not managed with oversight from our school-based nurses. There is now a mandate that we are reaching out to do immunization, screening, physical, dental for our students who are on home education programs. I have a question. Sure. Why are they overseeing Villa Maria and St. Patrick? Is that a legal requirement? Are they paying us for the service or is it just a legal thing we need to do? So it is in within PA code that any parochial school that's within our residential limits that we provide health care support. Now what I will say is they are our nurses are not spending exorbitant amounts of time. A lot of these institutions have a health care provider for at least part of the time but we are responsible in our SHARS reporting period to include those schools with the amount of immunizations, making sure they're getting regular screenings. And if um, there are supply needs that we're required to actually allocate, so there are some supplies, they have their own orders and the district actually sends those things there. So at times it's a box of Band-Aids because they might be out of that and we help to provide those. And not every school takes us up on the offer of support. So this number could actually be higher with the number of schools in our area. Malvern Prep, for example, mm -hmm. isn't on here, but if they wanted to require, um, we would be obligated to provide that same support for them. But then are we required to report on all the parochial schools or only if they want us to? Do we have to some obligation with the state for all of them? Only if they're taking advantage of our services. There's an assurance that they complete to say that they're waiving our involvement. I had no idea. Thank you for that information. Sure. If you add up the enrollment of just the three schools there, it's probably about 1,000 students. Um, that you have in addition to the home education students. So uh, it's significant and it could be, be higher, as I said. Any other questions yeah. about this particular set of information? Okay, so I'm providing this information just as context so that you can see sort of across the district some things that um, rise to more critical care needs in the day-to-day. 
So as I had said before, IDEA, which is our special education provision, and 504 is another governing body in addition to the PA code for our nurses. So we're seeing an increase across, even beyond just Great Valley, in complex health conditions that we're serving. So overall, again, you'll see about 15 to 18% in terms of research that was done you know, quite a few years ago at this point. The information that you're seeing listed out on the slide are actually reflected of current Great Valley numbers. So our allergies requiring EpiPens, we have about 238 throughout the district. Asthma, which you have varying intensity with asthma, but at 281. There are cardiac and cardiac conditions that may require emergency decision-making or emergency rescue meds. Diabetes requiring insulin. There are students who receive catheter changes. Some students are able to self-cath, which means that they just need some supervision during the day, but there are other students that require a nurse or a nurse assistant with nurse oversight to be able to administer the catheterization. And any seizure disorder requiring medications like a diastat do require a nurse to be present. Uh, there's also G-tube feeding, which we had talked about a little bit earlier. And then in, in general, when I was consulting with the nurses, they had shared 53 total medical conditions that differed across the district, but this is just a, a small sampling for you to see. Any questions? So we just wanted to get that in front of you now as we have our budgetary discussions. We'll have some additional programmatic and staffing considerations on Monday the 15th, and we'll continue the dialogue. But if there's any questions, things you want us to bring back next week, please let us know. Andrea, thank you very much for your efforts here. Uh, any additional questions? Can you um, speak to the um, the loss of the ESSER fund specifically with regard to the um, the program at the high school, the, um, the mentoring program? Mm -hmm. um, and how that might be affected and what the plans are for that. Yep, and we we have that built in for Monday's presentation, but just to at least address your question lightly, if I may. Um, so currently our high school has used uh, ESSER funds to fund three mentor, what we'll call mentor physicians, who do a blend of supporting children, whether it could be their executive functioning, helping them stay on top of assignments, and also doing a combination of teaching select classes uh, to assist. Uh, it's been running the you know, since ESSER funds, I think, out of the gate, it was one of the things that the high school wanted to put um, funds toward. So as you are aware, ESSER funds will go away uh, next September. And so in Monday's presentation on the 15th, uh, we'll talk about is there a way to possibly replicate uh, similar like positions to, to meet some of the needs that we're seeing at our high school. So um, does that kind of give you at least a, an essence, or is there a more detailed question that... Okay, but the team is working on that and that was part of, because uh, I do think that factors into that larger system of support discussion that we want to have with the board, um, K to 12 next week. And then kind of on a related note, there was also discussion about adding additional multilingual language or multilingual support and is that something that's still on the table? Yeah, at this point, I don't believe we're gonna propose, we, we want to kind of work with the position that we have, so we're not looking to replicate that, um, but that, may change but right now we do not have any proposals in our staffing to add an additional um, multilingual liaison yep. um for next monday's presentation are you also going to let us know where you anticipate putting the additional um nurse shall i hold off no we actually um andrew do you want to speak to sure, that we have talked about it'll be predominantly at the high school but there's some other needs so Please. Yeah, so our population is just popping over that 1,500 at the high school. So we anticipate um, this year, because we have brought our nurse on who will be serving the 5-6 a bit earlier, we are currently running a model that's very similar in that the home base of that nurse is at our high school. And then as needs become available at lower levels, if there are sub needs, that person is deployed. If they are doing screening and need a second hand, that person can be deployed. So we see it as being something that would address the district's needs, but primarily offsetting some of the um, enrollment at the high school. It's a little bit more of a floater. To a certain extent, but yes. But yes, it's important that the high school also have, just based on the sheer number, one more body in that suite. But yes. Um, 
although we would add um, another nurse for some of these more intensive um, needs and maybe through, you know, kind of float through other buildings, um, just knowing the sheer volume and understanding that a lot of what's involved with the school, school nurse is um, paperwork, administrative stuff, things that don't necessarily require <laughs> that, that level of degree, um, that maybe we can also think about ways to support those nurses um, to take some of the things off of their caseload so they can truly focus on the medical needs um, and, and less do less of the paperwork. Well, Neha, I think that's a really good point and I'm gonna pay you back on that. I think that's what I'm struggling to understand is is it really paperwork? Like, well, I don't know what the breakdown is. Like I look at that list and it seems daunting to me. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying like a lot of it's paperwork, but really what does that breakdown look like? And again, I don't need like exact numbers, but I think it's really hard for us to make an informed decision when it's like, is I don't know, making these numbers up. 60% paperwork and 40% is doing all of these other things where, again, some kind of breakdown I think would be really helpful. So I can give you a sense. Um, the nurses and I, when we were collaborating, just kind of talked about a, a day in the life, like what it, what it could look like. Um, so part of the paperwork in the day-to-day -day is that most of the visits, a little bit different than what we might see in other entities, are as needed. So as, as the needs arise, students are coming into those health suites to have whatever conditions looked at. So it's approximately 40 visits. So each of those visits, part of the paperwork piece for any clerical support that we have currently, they're helping to log those visits when the students come into the suite so that the nurses are not spending their time doing that, but actually treating students and anything that can be given to another individual within that suite, then they're delegating, but they're the person who is making that decision within that suite. The other pieces of paperwork are the immunization piece, and we actually have some clerical support, particularly when um, we have new students enrolling in the district, so summer is a big time for that. As families are registering within the district, we have a clerical individual who is reviewing immunizations because it's a checklist, so to speak, and making sure that those immunizations are complete then coordinating with the nurse so that they have final oversight of that, but entering into our student information system, all of those immunizations, any medical conditions that occur in that, and then also the screening data. So anytime there's a mandated health screening that needs to occur, height, weight, things like that, the clerical piece of that at times they're getting support. So at our secondary level currently, there's a bit more clerical support. I would say at the elementary level, right now we're looking at about an hour in the health suite, which to your point, when we're looking at how we're supporting those individuals might not be comparable. So that's certainly something to look at. Thank you. And sort of on the other end of that question though, like so, so like, you know, like I see the argument for, for how you would staff when to, to support with paperwork. But I guess, I, and I'm wondering, I don't know how often this happens, but say you have a nurse that calls out sick and you have somebody who comes in and who is hired maybe to fill more of that paperwork support role. Um, but, but then you have a kid with a, a breakthrough seizure who needs Zyfac and how is that administered? You know, just, just to end situation. That's another great question. Thank you. Um, so our nurses currently, we partner with some agencies. I will tell you that finding agency support is incredibly difficult we will put out requests to have nurses come in to sub even in advance. So our nurses, for the most part, I can just give an example that they might have an appointment scheduled, we don't get a sub, and they're just the kind of individuals who are like, I'll reschedule my appointment because that's sort of the difficulty that they're seeing in their role. Um, we do, right now we're surviving on some of our retirees. So a plug for people who have retired from the position of CSN at Great Valley, they have hooked up with some of our uh, agency partners, they know our programs, they know our systems, and so they are coming in to help to provide some of that substitute support as well. But having someone who knows, because at some point those individuals I'm sure will wanna truly retire, I'm hoping that that never happens, but I know that that's not, that's not really a reasonable request or expectation. But having someone who is here on a regular basis that knows the students, because if you think about a sub binder for nurses in the health suite, they have to have pictures 
of every student. So if you're administering medication, not only are you assuring the name, but you need to make sure that you're assuring the student physically. So if you have sort of a rotating cast, it becomes more difficult. So that's a great question. Thank you. And related to that are field trips and the like when a nurse has to go on a, on a larger field trip, the sub coverages, the absences. Uh, we're certainly not proposing this as sub coverage, um, but the reality is it's, uh, we have several agencies and we're just not able to get the substitute. So uh, we feel there's more complex needs. I know the question is about clerical. The feedback that I'm getting is that it's more hands-on to provide medical services, not necessarily the paper burden. Although we could bring some relief at the elementary, as Andrea said, there's um, secondary schools have, have a good bit of support, but the elementary doesn't. But clerical. it really is, yeah. <laughs> secondary yeah. has clerical support. Clerical they, need support. The, they need the critical care support up there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes our report. Just some staffing considerations for the future. I just had one comment. I know we talked about it last week, but I just want to make sure that next week with the, the list, which will be these plus the other positions, that we do get some kind of prioritization. They, they all sound very important, but in case we can't, mm -hmm. it will be really helpful for us to see your, yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, once you have the complete list, we'll make sure they're, they're in context. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. All right. So, moving to facilities. Who's handling facilities? Okay, Tari, you're up, Mr. Peterson. You want to go through these for us? Under facilities this evening, again, we, as usual, we have several uh, change orders. The first is item 6.01, and that's uh, the contract with David Maines, who's done the entire roof for the 5-6 Center. It was discovered that there were some uh, snow guards that were not included on the original plans, and so um, that would create a dangerous situation with the snow falling because it's a metal roof, so we had to add, add the additional snow guard. That's the only change order we've had with David Maines, and we don't ex expect any, any others. Um, item 6.02, 6.03 and 6. and 4 and 5 are all low bar, the general contractor for the 5-6 center. Um, 602 is a total of $32,800, which was uh, structural steel that was missing from the design that tied the, the uh, canopy to the building. Uh, additional metal studs um, in the building and then in the kitchen area uh, to meet the um, Board of Health regulations, they had to add additional studs uh, and close in above the refrigerator and freezer. 603, uh, again, those items are listed separately, but that, that is a uh, change order of $11,727 uh, to add metal framing and fire doors and additional wall boarding. In, um, and finally, uh, we did get a credit on this one for the uh, acoustical ceiling baffles. They they had a reduction in that amount, so that's rare we get to see a credit instead of uh, additional cost. 6.04 is um, a large change order in the amount of $90,598. This is to add about 21 additional parking spaces. If you can uh, imagine having your back to Church Road and facing the old building, the power lines on the right-hand side that's going to be the service entrance going back to the school. That'll take you back to the to the loading dock um, and deliveries uh, and, and food service and all that. Uh, there's a road being put in there already, and they were put in a few parking spaces, but we found we can add an additional 21 spaces, and an analysis that's been done showed that it's really going to be needed. Uh, we're still hoping that there'll be enough by adding those 21. I was uh, surprised by the price tag, but I vetted it with the architects and site logic. They did both did independent analysis and said that it's it's a fair price that's that's being asked, and it would actually cost us more if we tried to do it do it later. But when it's being done with the original road being put in and the drainage and curbing and everything, it'll be more efficient. Will those uh, spaces be accessible also for when there's an event at the school and you need extra parent parking, or is it so far along the side that it's really only? Employees. Yeah, I don't think so because we wouldn't want the, the people it's coming in the side. back door. Yeah, yeah, okay. They need to come in the right. front. Great. Yeah, Thank you. And then um, the last change order there is 605, again with low bar. Change order 33 is $33,348. Um, this was 
uh, to install vinyl tile because they found out that the BBT that was uh, specced was discontinued. And then on the ramp area, especially the, the big long ramp that comes out of the um, administrative suite and the food the, where the, the dining hall and everything is to go up to the second floor, uh, they discovered that, that was the, the surface wasn't going to pass code because of slips and falls. So there'll be a rubber service put on that, uh, which will meet code and, and be safer for the students. Uh, that's everything under, under facilities, I believe. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No? And then you'll see there the information item, the facilities use report for, every, for uh, everyone's perusal. Um, do we have anything under transportation? No, nothing under transportation or food service. Okay, so we'll move on to technology. Technology, we have um, two items. Uh, the first is the RICO copiers for the Phi 6 Center. Um, this is under the CoStars contract. Uh, it'll be for 15 black and white copiers, one color, and there'll be a, um, a um, rebate of of about $5,775. Um, this would be one one copier for each level of the pods. Uh, there'll be a couple in the in the administrative suite and then in the um, STEAM and the library center. So this is covering all the copier needs of the uh, five, six center. Got a question on that one when I read Yes, please. Did, did we consider leasing at all? I don't know if it's common practice today to still buy copiers or I, I think businesses often lease them and then you get the newest ones and if they break, you don't have to worry about it. Is that something schools do and did you look at that? Yeah, some schools do that. Um, our technology supervisor, Candy, does work with the companies on that and they compare the lease costs with the, with the um, outright buys. And because of the state contract pricing we get, often it's more efficient because we, we also keep the copiers for a long time. For example, these next item here with replacing some of the elementary copiers, those are replacing 10-year-old copiers. So a lot of times with leases, they only last for five years, and then you have to either buy them out, upgrade, and then there's an interest charge put on on the leases. So we do monitor that, but we think it's more efficient to just own this, the copiers. Thank you. I'm glad you considered it. Yep. And that takes me to 902, which is uh, one replacement for each of the elementary schools and um, one for the middle school. We've been trying to cycle these things now. In the past, we would wait till almost every machine in the building was dead and then replace them all at the same time. And that creates a lot of problems because when one machine goes down, you need a reliable one somewhere else. And it also spreads the financing out over, over years instead of doing it all at once. Okay, to go to finance. All right, that's me, right? Yeah, the first item. Yep. So the finance, as uh, the, the board held a finance committee meeting on April 2nd, and we've talked a lot about that meeting here tonight because um, in addition to the 24-25 um, budget draft um, that included recommended staffing and costs related to the five six center. Uh, the first draft of the 24-25 budget included a real estate tax increase equal to the Act 1 index of 5.3%. The draft presented at the committee meeting reduced the increase to 3.75%. Uh, the administration reviewed the potential tax rebate program initially presented at the October 29th Finance Committee meeting and again at the January 29th Finance Committee meeting. Uh, the board instructed the administration to include the program on the April agenda for consideration. Uh, and then our next Finance Committee meeting is scheduled for May 6th. Okay, and that property tax rebate program is the next item here, yep. uh, item 10.02. Um, the board and administration is really pleased to present this, this uh, potential program. Um, we've gone over it, like I said, with the board three times in detail, and those were publicized, uh, streamed to the public. Uh, the information is also posted on the agenda, resources from the state. Uh, so I don't want to go into it tonight in detail, but it is um, a, a piggyback program on the state the program that the state's been running for years, that eligible people. Now, when I say eligible, what is that? You have to be over 65, have income limitations. Um, mostly it's a less than 45,000 in household income. So be over 65 or be a widow or widower 50, uh, over 50 years old 
um, or 18 and older and, and permanently disabled and, and then meet those income guidelines. So if you apply for the state program, and this is always on a fiscal year program um, with, this, with the school district, it's July 1 through June 30. Um, and folks, the state program runs on that same fiscal year that folks could still be applying for this year's program, even though the, the school district won't operate a program till July 1 of 25 or 24 if the board doesn't approve it. So if the board approves this program, um, we're offering a percentage of the state rebate. So the, the state rebate, the max anybody could possibly get is $1,500. So the, lar the, the, the largest rebate that we, the school district would see, we're recommending 35% would be $525. So folks that come in under that 1500 the rebate will be less. But the good thing is, is they would already be getting a rebate from the state and then get an additional rebate from the school district by presenting all their paperwork and show that they were uh, approved at the state level. Um, so we're recommending that uh, the board approve this. We'll, we'll publish it, and then folks can apply to the school district from July 1 of 24 through J June 30 of 25 and, and show their, that they've received a rebate from the, from the state, and then we'll uh, issue a check to them for a rebate from the school district. So. Again, there's lots of resources available on our, on our agenda for the public to understand this better, and we'll be happy to ask, answer questions if folks want to give us a call. Any questions on that one? All right. Um, 1003 is our annual uh, renewal with the Special Olympics. I think this will be the third year, maybe, that we've been uh, they've been hosting some uh, track and uh, other sporting events at the high school for, for kids with special needs. Uh, 1004 is our annual adoption of the IU's core and occupational budgets. Um, the um, core budget is expected to cost this Great Valley 49,000, and we're estimating that the occupational budget will be 1,172,000. That's a three-year average of, of the number of students we have attending the occupational programs. 1005 is a uh, a contract to provide some public speaking and media training for $12,800. 10.06, we use the uh, Central, uh, the uh, uh, Chester County Intermediate Unit Consortium. All the districts, I think, in the county are participating in that as well as some beyond. So we do joint purchasing for electricity. The current contract we have expires in the summer of 2025, so a year from now. But the advisors are saying that this is really a good time. They expect the prices to continue to increase in the future. So this is a good time for us to lock in now. But the way the program works is they go out for these bids and then they have like 24 hours to commit um, or because the price can fluctuate so quickly uh, with the electronic electric um, supply costs. So they require that we do an approval within um, a day after the, the bids are open. So this is authorizing me to make that approval with retroactive board endorsement. 1007 is uh, our educational service contracts this month. We have two with LearnWell, two with Kids Peace, and one with, one with the Vanguard School. 1008 will be the preliminary budget resolution for 2425. Uh, there's a template there on the agenda, but we'll go over this in a little more detail next Monday. Uh, it'll pr pretty much mimic the presentation we did at the Finance Committee meeting. Um, we did, and we'll highlight the changes rather than go through the whole thing. Um, it, uh, Sheree and I believe that we'll have the uh, percentage down to three and a half. So we started at 5.3, went to 3.75. We think we'll be able to, to come in at 3.5 for the preliminary budget. And uh, it's it, by law, we have to have that preliminary budget approved at least 30 days before the final. But the board has for, full authority to amend that either up or down. So if you approve that millage increase at 3.5 um, and we need to increase that, we can. If we, need to, if we can decrease it, we can. And we'll continue to work administratively to try to make sure that um, we're only asking for what the, we really need to make sure we're providing the education for the good education for the students. And the last item there is the contract with Dr. Debbie Zarkarnian. Uh, this is professional development for administrators and ELL teachers. It will provide six virtual sessions and six hours of consultations in April through June of 24. Uh, cost is $20,000 and it will be paid by the uh, Ready to Learn group.
Any questions on any of those items? Great, thank you. No questions? All right, excellent. All right, so we do we, we don't have any additional committee reports or board comments? No. Okay, great. Um, so the draft agenda is there and then public comment, correct? Mm -hmm. So now's the time if you, um, if the public has a comment, if you come up to the podium, tell us your name, um, address, and we'll have a timer set up. And when it bings, it's, you still have 30 seconds left, so. Good evening, I'm here tonight to bring your attention to an urgent matter regarding the possible contract renewal of the head coach of the football team at Great Valley High School. It is my firm belief that due to a terrible record, poor leadership and possible violations of the PIAA bylaws and PA code of conduct for educators, the contract of the head coach should not be renewed for the upcoming season until a review process and an investigation is conducted. Dr. Grafredo, Mike Seymour, and Dr. Capitola have been aware of these issues, issues for quite some time, and I feel it is necessary to bring your attention to this problem. This has been going on for years, and everyone has been talking about it behind closed doors until now. These issues need to be made public, and they need your attention. The performance of the football team under the guidance of the current coach has been disappointing, to say the least. The team's record and overall performance have been below par, and it is evident that there is lack of effective leadership and coaching. This was once a winning program. This once a winning program has declined into a losing program with the number of players dwindling each year. As a result, the morale and motivation of the players have suffered, leading to a decline in the team's performance. I would like to highlight that in the past five years, under the current coaches, um, football team had only one winning season and four losing ones, while in the five seasons under the previous head coach, we had four winning seasons and one losing one. In the five years of this coach's tenure as the Great Valley football coach, he has scored a thousand less points than five years prior. Furthermore, I would like to highlight that a survey was conducted by the district and sent to parents this fall. There was also a survey conducted by school district parents that was sent to former football players. The results of both surveys were overwhelmingly negative and the feedback received from the survey clearly indicates dissatisfaction with the coaching and leadership provided by the current head coach. Parents and students alike have expressed concerns about the lack of development, recruitment, support, and leadership from the coach. More alarming is how the students describe the environment within the team. Players said they felt undervalued, demoralized, and unfairly treated. Some students say, stated that he played favorites, he ostracized them, he ruined the experience, and he even humiliated them in front of their teammates. This biased behavior not only undermines players' confidence, but also hinders their growth and development as athletes and young men. With so much focus on mental illness these days, this should not be tolerated at any level for any period of time. I also believe this to be a conflict of interest as the football coach is also a guidance counselor at the high school. The former players reference his favoritism, but isn't Great Valley all about equity and inclusion? It is crucial for the school board to consider the feedback and sentiments of the parents and students who are directly impacted by the coach's performance. As stakeholders in the school community, our opinions and experiences should be taken into account when making decisions that affect the well-being and success of our student athletes. While neighboring districts have thriving academic and athletic programs, thank you.
Yep, and then hone in again. Yep. Okay. And can you just can you just tell us who you are and your address back up at the podium? Yeah, just so we can. This township. Township. Sorry, township. Maureen Homley, East White Lane. Great. Thank you. Uh, Michael Helmley, 20 Deer Run Lane, Malvern, PA. We've had three boys play football since 2010, the Great Valley Program. One played under the former coach, one played under this coach. There, When we met with C, our ADC Mar on Friday and Dr. Capitola, she told me that culture is 100% what she's behind. She loves sports, and that's great. So um, my wife just passed out what's going on, you know, the surveys and everything. They're terrible. They're horrible. This is not someone that should be leading any young man. And I've had two boys play for him now. And I have a third boy coming up. And I'm very invested with all the younger people in the middle school. These surveys are going out to all them. It's going to be on social media. But here's something I want you to listen to. After the Shanahan game this year, my son comes home Saturday practice and says, this is what coach told us. After you guys run plays wrong and jump off sides, what do you tell your parents? That it's the coach's fault? No, you should be telling them it's your fault, not your coach's. I believe that's a violation of PIA rules as far as coaching, but it also, in the midst of your fourth losing season, out of five, to tell my kid to come tell me that it's his fault, that's an embarrassment. It's disgusting, and you need to take care of it. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, uh, announcement of executive session. The board met in executive session to talk about some legal and personnel items, and um, I can adjourn the meeting, correct? Yep. All right, thank you guys. Have a good night.